Praise the Lord. You know, if you have your Bible, open your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 21 through 23. Before I, as soon as I got here, a lady gave me this note that I'm holding in my hand. And it's a very detailed notes of last Sunday's sermon. <clears throat> Although it, it, it wasn't by a, an adult. It was by a little kid that was taking notes and was being touched by God. And it says, if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be asked. That's all she put. You won't be asked. <laughs> but how many of y'all know when you come to church, there's kids that are watching. There's kids that are also being blessed. You can never go wrong raising your kids. In the house of God, amen. Luke chapter 15, verses 21 through 23. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and some sandals. If you're Latino, chanclas. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Now, verses 29 through 32 of that same chapter. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave, up, gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet... When this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing a fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost. Somebody said lost. He was lost. Somebody say lost. lost. Say with an attitude. Say he was lost. He was lost. But now he is found. <laughs> I'm going to minister on the subject today. There's no place like home. Amen. Before we pray, touch the neighbor, the one that you like next to you. Tell him there's no place like home. Now look at your other neighbor, the one that you tolerate, and tell them there's no place like home. <laughs> Every head bowed in reverence to God. We ask that you have your cell phones. Please put them on silent. We don't want to hear your Norteño or 50 Cent ringer. Amen. In reverence to God. Every head bowed. Lord Father, we thank you because you woke us up another day. God, we just don't thank you for the big things. That's all cool, God, and we'll give you the praise, but we thank you for the small things that we're breathing. We thank you that even though we might be hurting, we're alive. And even though some of, you, some of them might have taken the bus, at least, Lord Father, we have the feet and the legs to walk in here, Lord God. That though we may not have all the money, but at least we still have our kids. At least we still have our spouse. Though even though we don't have a spouse or we don't even have kids, God, we always will have you. We just don't give you praise in the big things. We give you praise and worship, Lord Father, and commitment in the small things. We give you all the honor and all the glory. We open our heart to receive from you today. We can never go wrong. We can go wrong with other people's opinions. Because sometimes their opinions are abstract. They're, and sometimes they're just that, an opinion. But Lord God, we can never go wrong by being obedient to your truth. Because your truth is not an opinion. It does not change over time. It does not change or conform to what's politically correct or what's popular. Your truth, Lord Father, you said you are the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Your truth is always a blessing. Your truth will always make the crooked way straight. Your truth will always correct us and mold us and cleanse us. It's your truth that sets us free. And we give you praise today. 
for your truth. And we open our hearts to receive it today because there's a, there's a truth that's about to be imparted into our heart. There's a truth that's about to be imparted into families, into single people, to divorced people, to Latino people, to whatever nationality, Lord God, we just thank you. Come on, put your hands together. Give it up for Jesus. High five two people and tell them there's no place like home. And you may have your seat. There are two stray dogs uh, that live at my house. One's named Scar, and the other name's Palo. Not Pablo, Palo. And before, they would come to my house every once in a while. Then after Palo got ran over twice, after Scar got beaten up multiple times by God knows who, I started to see them, I started to see a consistency of them staying at my house. We would give them breakfast, sometimes dinner. They always had fresh water. Whenever I could, I would give them hugs and rub their tummy. And all of a sudden, I began to see that they began to make my house their permanent house. And regardless of where they would stray away during the day, they would always make their way back to my house in the night because they realized one truth, follow and scar, that there is no place like home. There is no place like an owner that loves them. There is no place like someone that shows them unconditional love in spite of what they did or where they been or who they used to belong to. There's no place like home. And if I could use that as a metaphor to the love that God has for us. I want to tell you that the best life and your blessed life is not away from God. Your, the blessed life is not living a life without God. I want to tell you that the best life and the blessed life is having God in your life and living for him all the days of your life. There's no place like having Jesus in your heart and being close to him. Jesus said, if you draw close to me, I will draw myself close to you and in our story we have the prodigal son who wanted to do his own thing the father treated him good the father loved him the father showed him unconditional love but yet the prodigal son thought that it would be better to live away from his father the bible says that he lived and he moved to a far country the prodigal son thought that a life independent from the Father is the best life and the blessed life. But he quickly found out that was he deceived himself and that was a lie. Because it doesn't give a specific time, but not much after he lived and moved out from the Father's house, he was bankrupt. He spent all his money, and as the Bible says, on strippers. He spent all his money. He was doing things that he thought he would never do he was feeding the pigs if you know anything about jewish culture if you don't well let me just give you a brief lesson uh for a jew to be around pigs was disgraceful but yet he was at an all-time low he even sold himself into slavery here you have a kid a son whose father was rich whose father had a palace but yet he was in the pig pen who was a son of the father, but yet he was living as a slave. Who had a home, but yet he was living far. Finally, the prodigal son said, why am I living like a slave when I'm a son of my father? Why am I starving when my father got some barbacoa and big red at home waiting for me and some filet mignon? Why am I living in the pig pen when I could be at the palace with my father? There's no place like home. And the Bible says in the old English translation, he came to himself. In other words, he changed his mind. He said, I, I don't belong here. I changed my mind. I'm going home. Uh, I, I'm, I'm above being a slave. I changed my mind. I'm going back to my father. And there's some of you here this morning. You need to tell the devil. You need to tell your sin. You need to tell the lifestyle that has taken you away from God. I've changed my mind. I'm going back to where I belong. Back with Jesus. Back for living for him. Back to having a relationship with him because there's no place like home. 
See, but it's not the tapping of the, like Dorothy did, that you travel back to God. It's in your heart. In fact, I would like to say this. You can be coming to the physical, structural church and yet still be far away from God. But I pray today, and I've been praying all this week, that that there'll be some prodigal sons, not only some prodigal sons, but some prodigal daughters that will come back home, make that journey back in their heart, because there is no place like home. There is no better life and no, no more blessed life than having a life with Jesus. So the question is, if you have strayed away in your heart from God, how do you make the journey back? If you have made the journey away from Christ, how do you make the journey back to Christ? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to about to tell you right now. First of all, I'm going to give you three points today on how to make the journey back to Christ if you have strayed away. Number one, if you're taking notes, which I challenge you if you're not, take some notes on your iPad, notepad, right on your wrist or forearm. And if you got tattoo sleeves, well, then find paper. Amen. I'm going to read your notes. There has to be repentance. Someone say repentance. When there's repentance, there's going to be restoration. Someone say restoration. And, and when there's restoration, then you can rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. Somebody say fiesta. How many of y'all know a life with God is a fiesta all day, every day? 24-7, 365 days a year. So there has to be repentance. The prodigal son repented. He just didn't feel bad. He just didn't regret. He just didn't have remorse. And that's all cool in a bag of chips because when, 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 when you're about to repent, you'll have those emotions. But emotions with no action is going to keep you in the same rut. I don't care how bad, if you fall in love with the idea of a change you, but don't fall in love with the actions, you're going to stay the same you. And when there, see, repentance is an inward change of heart that is followed through with an outward action. Repentance is an inward change of heart that is followed through with an outward action. 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. When there is repentance, there's going to be confession. God says, if, if you confess, I don't care what sins you did, God says, I will forgive them all. And that word, that phrase, if you confess in the original language, it means to say the same thing. In the original language, it means confession means to say the same thing. So in conjunction with the scripture of 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, if we could have it up there, what it means is when you confess your sins, you are saying the same thing that God's word says about your sin, that it's wrong. So you're saying, God, I confess the lifestyle I've been living, the mindset I've been having is wrong. See, and the beautiful part about it is regardless how much your lifestyle or your mindset is contradicting the scriptures and the nature of God, God says, I will forgive you of whatever you have done. I don't care how dirty. I don't care how big. I don't care how long you were doing it. And like I've always said, I don't care if they have a YouTube video of you doing it. God says, I will forgive you. It's under the blood of Jesus. Amen. It is forgiven. See, but God doesn't just forgive that which is contradicting his nature in the word. God empowers you so that you can complement his nature and what the word says. It's like, if I may use the example, if your wife, you and your wife, get invited to a party. And it's a very, very elaborate a uh, fancy party, and your wife goes and she gets her nails done. She gets her hair done, spends all this money. She gets her eyelashes done. 
She gets every, she buys, she puts on, she gets her most expensive purse, most expensive Louis Vuitton, puts on those high heels, and she gets her most expensive dress, and, and she says, honey, I'm ready to go. And yet the husband says, well, I'm ready to go, but he has shorts on. And has a, a t-shirt that has a picture of a tuxedo on it. <laughs> See, there's a contradiction there. But if, if the husband humbles himself and honors the wife that is looking good like all that in a bag of chips and says, baby, I'm going to put on my best suit. I'm going to fix up my hair. I'm going to put on the nicest shoes I have. And I'm, we're going to go from contradicting to complimenting each other. And we're going to go to this party and we're going to have ourselves a good time. See, and God gives us grace and the Holy Spirit. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is power to overcome the sins and the lifestyles that you are dealing with and struggling with. The Holy Spirit lives in the inside of you to convict you, to mold you, to change you. Jesus said, if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. And when you, hallelujah, begin to trust and put a demand on the anointing of God, people will see you and they'll see God living in you and through you and the way you think and the way you talk and the way you treat others. He not only forgives that which contradicts, he empowers so that you can complement God, you like that slide? I could do that on this John Travolta anointing. <laughs> but when there's change, there's not only confession. You have to follow through with action, or it's not true repentance. Remorse, like I said, remorse is good. Regret is good. I, I feel bad about doing it. I wish I would have never done that. Ehule, they have me on video doing that too. Have me on camera. That's good. But there has to be some action behind your confession. The prodigal son was in the hog pen. But notice, he didn't stay in the hog pen. It was straight out of the hog pen. And he went back to the father's house. It was the hog pen that he was wasting his potential. It was in the hog pen that he was living in poverty and bankrupt. It was in the hog pen that he was doing things that he told himself he would never do. See, in the hog pen is symbolic of those lifestyles in which we're wasting the potential and the anointing and the gifting that God has given us. The hog pen is symbolic of those lifestyles that you may be living right now, those lifestyles that you said, you says, tell yourself years ago, I would never do that. And now you're finding yourself doing things that you told yourself you would never do. But yet the prodigal son said, I, I will rise and I will go to my father's house. See, if you sow actions behind your decision, you will start reaping results and stop reaping consequences. I'll say that again. If you sow actions behind your decision that you have made in your heart, you'll stop you'll start reaping results and stop reaping consequences. And how many of y'all know there's a difference between results and a difference between consequences? Consequences is the bad things that have been happening to you because you're in the hog pen. But results is what you get in the Father's house. Results is the blessing. Results is the abundance. Results is freedom. Results is the chains being broken. Somebody shout repentance. Thank you, Steve. Steve said he shouted repentance. When there is repentance, it allows God to restore you. When there is repentance, it allows God to restore you. Notice <clears throat> when the prodigal son came back to his, father house, to his father's house, he hadn't even stepped a foot into his dad's house. He was down the road. And his father saw him from afar off. He saw them all the way down from Southwest Military Drive. Zazamora or Guadalupe Street, wherever he was at. And he didn't even wait for the son to arrive in the house. But the father ran out 
and kissed him and hugged him. Some translation says that he fell on his neck because he was so excited. He humiliated himself. The father did. Let me give you a brief lesson on Jewish culture. For a father to run out to his son was a big no-no in their culture. For a father to run out to his son like the way he did was considered undignified in Jewish culture. But yet the father was willing to humiliate himself, not because he was not all there, but because his love for his son, his son had finally come home. Jesus ran from heaven to earth and humiliated himself because he loves you. He left heaven and he put down his crown of diamonds and gold and he put on the crown of thorns. He left his throne in heaven to where he was worshipped by angels and they waited on him to meet his every need. He ran from heaven and ran down to earth to seek out, to run after that which is lost, hurting, and broken. So that he could be a servant to all. He left heaven and he exchanged his heavenly garments his kingly garments, and he exchanged him for the garments of blood that covered his naked body on the cross. Why did Jesus humiliate himself on this earth? Because he is that much in love with you, with you, and you, and you. God loves you, and that's why he did what he did. He humiliated himself so that Gangbangers and drug dealers can put down their crack and put down their guns and put down their colors and pick up the cross. He, he humiliated himself so that the depressed could have the joy of the Lord. He humiliated himself so that those who, have, who are chained and bound and demon possessed and oppressed can be set free in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus did it all because he loves you. Somebody shout Jesus. Loves me. Come on, put your hands in the air and look up to the heavens. And say, Jesus, you love me. Thank you. Don't tell Jesus I love you. Tell him thank you for loving me. How many of you are thankful that he loves you? Amen. But notice, the father just didn't run to him. He gave him a ring. He gave him a ring. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 says that when we come to God, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal. He gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal. In other words, he seals you with the Holy Spirit. And what that signifies is you belong to him. You're his son. You're his daughter. The Bible says that your body is a holy temple and the spirit of God lives in the inside of you. You won't purchase with food stamps, credit cards, or money. You are uh, purchased with blood. Hallelujah. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You're sealed. Somebody say, I'm sealed. I'm a son and I'm a daughter. So in essence, when he comes home and by the, prod by the father giving the prodigal son a ring, he says, regardless of you living in slavery and sinning and spending your money on strippers, God says, you still, the, the, the father said, you are still a son to me. I never stopped loving you as a son. Regardless of you acting un, un, undignified and doing all these living in darkness, the father said, I never gave up hope on you. See, and, and God wants me to tell somebody God wants me to tell somebody here that, that even though you, were, you may have been living in sin and re-enslaved yourself, God never unsun you just because you've been living in sin. Though you may have been here and been a woman who's been living in dis a destructive lifestyle, God never stopped calling you his daughter. God never threw away the destiny and the purpose that he has for your life because you belong to him. Somebody shout, I belong to him. I belong 
to Jesus. I belong to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit lives in the inside of me. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. Though you may have been in the strip club, you're still a son. Though you may have snorted a line of coke before you came to this church, you're still a daughter. Though you may have been swinging from a pole, hallelujah, Jesus still hung on the cross for you. Though you mocked and cursed God and said you will never serve him, serve him, Jesus says that he still loves you. You still belong to him. God has not stopped loving you. See, but the ring is not just a seal. It's a guarantee. It's a, it's a deposit. It's a down payment. Men, when you find the woman of your dreams and you love her and care about her and she's your girlfriend and you say, you know what? I want to spend eternity with you, baby. Loving you is wrong. I don't want to be right. You look her in the eyes and you tell her that. But if you're going to spend eternity with her, you better give her an engagement ring. All the women said amen and all the men stayed quiet. Amen. <laughs> the flea market is right down there. Amen. But the engagement ring is not, it's just a down payment. It's just a guarantee that there's more to come. There's another more expensive ring that's coming your way, baby, if you to stick with me. There is a wedding and there is a cake and there's your wedding dress that I, I got for you, Masota, because I want to marry you. There's a lot more where that came from. It's just a down payment. <laughs> and, and, and some of you that have been so far away from God... You, you think that because you've wasted your 20s and you've wasted your teenage years living away from God because you've been destroying your life in your 30s and in your 40s that God wants nothing to do with you and that your best days are behind you. But I want to tell you, God wants me to tell you that your most blessed days and best days are not behind you, but they're ahead of you. Hallelujah. Because you got... You got the ring. You got the ring of the Holy Spirit that is upon your life. And God wants, God still has a plan for you. You belong to him. That's why when you took all the pills and tried to kill yourself, you still woke up the next day. Be That's why when you put the gun inside your mouth and you pulled the trigger, nothing came out. That's why when you told God, I want nothing to do with you, yet he kept sending people your way, telling you, you got to come back to Jesus. Jesus still loves you. I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you, daughter. The best is not behind you. It's ahead of you. That's why when you got in that car accident and you should have died, uh, but, but yet you didn't. That's why when there was that drive-by and yet the bullet had your name on it but yet you're still here you're not in the mortuary but you're in the sanctuary the reason why is because jesus said devil that son that daughter belongs to me back off devil he belongs to me but when you get restored there needs to be rejoicing the father Threw a party for the son. But not everybody was happy that Mijo came back. Or Mija. Not everyone was happy. The, 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 the other son was like, man, I hear a DJ. I smell brisket. I, I smell all these. There's four kegs of Kool-Aid and apple juice. Christian version, all right? <laughs> and this dude spent all his money on strippers. And I've always been the faithful son, and, and he was jealous and he was envious. And I want to tell you in advance, sons and daughters of the Most High, that don't expect everybody to rejoice when you come back to God. And the reason why I tell you that is because a lot of people will be live away from God for years and then they come back to God and they have some jealous, envious, hating, religious, hateful person that says, oh, you don't deserve you. you if you go to church, you're going to church now. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. 
oh, yeah, you've changed, but look at this and look at that. You call yourself a Christian, but look at you. You're still saying this and you're still doing that. Don't expect everybody to rejoice when God has restored you. See, but that's okay if they don't want to rejoice that you've come back. Because even when your family or friends do not rejoice or are not happy that you have come back to God, I want to tell you, according to Luke chapter 15, verse 7, right now, at this point, heaven is rejoicing. The angels are having a party right now. God is having a party that his son and his daughter is coming back. Even if they feel that you are not qualified to be blessed because of the sinful lifestyle, understand that they don't, who cares if they don't feel that you're qualified because the blood of Jesus has qualified you. Mercy and grace has qualified you to be blessed and you, in spite of you, living away from God. See, but can I tell you that, that you'll have family and friends that won't, that will be unhappy that you're being restored. But I want to tell you something that there are some demons and there is Satan that is going to be that's going to be hating on you that you're going back to God. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 says that he is the devil and Satan. Satan is not his name. The devil is not his name. Those are titles that describe how he functions. Those are titles that describe his character. His name is Lucifer. Please don't name your kids Lucifer. (laughs) But the devil, Satan, means the hater. That's what it means. It means that, that he hates. And understand that when you make a choice to come back to God, there's going to be a devil in hell that's going to be hating on you. That you are coming back to your father's house. And let me tell you why he's hating on you. He's hating on you because you're about to go from being overwhelmed to being an overcomer again in Christ Jesus. He's hating on you because you're about to, be, you're about to go from being weak in depression to being strong in the joy of the Lord and the peace that passes all understanding. He's hating on you because you're about to go from walking in chains, chained down with anxiety, chained down with fear, chained down with spirits of suicide, chained down with spirits of lust and all this. You're about to go from walking in chains to walking in the freedom of the Lord. You can best... You can bet that he is going to hate and does not want to see you. Satan tried to do everything he could to fight you from being in this house this morning. But I've come to call the devil a liar and a hater and let him hate all he wants. But God's going to use your haters as elevators to take you back to the place where you belong. Don't let Satan, don't let people hate you back to the hog pen. But tell Satan and tell those people, I don't care how much you hate on me. I'm going to my father's house where I belong. I'm going back. But the father said, he told the brother, the other brother, the the jealous one. He said, your son, your brother has come back. Your son, your brother has come back. Rejoice that God has brought him back safely notice he said God has brought him back safely and you know what God is rejoicing over you and don't get me wrong there are family and friends that have been praying for you there's mamas that have been fasting for you daddies that have been believing for you to come back and you know what they're rejoicing that you're in this place here this morning amen But you, you know who ought to be rejoicing, who ought to be thanking God, who ought to be giving God the praise? You should. You ought to be rejoicing 
that you're not just here, but you're here alive. You ought to be rejoicing, hallelujah, that God still loves you. You ought to be rejoicing that God is restoring you. You ought to be rejoicing. I wonder if we can take about five seconds and just rejoice over yourself. Rejoice over what God is doing in your life. If no one will rejoice for you, rejoice and praise God what he's doing in you. God, I thank you that you're changing me. God, I thank you that my past is forgiven. God, I thank you that in spite of how I live, that you still love me. The Bible says, let the redeem of the Lord say so.